All right, good morning. And I know people probably filter in, it's Friday morning at 9.30. You guys probably all went to the party last night, right? Who went, to, who went to the party? Raise your hands. All right, you guys enjoy it? Raise your hands if you enjoyed it. All right, he, he's, not, he's not convinced, but a few folks enjoyed it, so that's good. So thank you, first and foremost, for actually making it out to a talk at 9.30 in the morning after that party. It was, it was great, yeah. I, I personally was out, I had a little, little bit of fun. Not too much, a little bit of fun. Um, so, uh, so hopefully you guys did too, um, but uh, thank you for coming. Um, folks will trickle in, but I, I figure the most important thing on Friday morning after a, a late night is to uh, get started on time and get out on time. So we're gonna move, we're gonna move through this and, and hopefully you'll learn something in the session this morning. Um, uh, it'll be me, uh, and then I actually have uh, Miles Kingston from Intel coming up in a little bit. Um, so uh, my name's on the slide, uh, Matt Tavis, uh, Solutions Architect. Uh, I've been at Amazon now 11 years. Um, so I've been incredibly lucky to have been kind of part of this whole cloud journey and, and the various things we did um, well before I even knew what was going on, back when companies would you know, say, you're just a retailer, right? Um, well, turns out we do a lot more than that, obviously, now. And so um, hopefully we'll learn, learn some things about what we're doing in the, uh, in the Alexa space. Um, so how many of you are uh, software developers? All right, about half, okay. How many of you actually uh, work with hardware? in terms of building devices. Okay, good, good, awesome, awesome. Yeah, thank you, Miles, yeah. <laughs> you don't count, yeah. <laughs> um, good, awesome. So, so uh, this is gonna be about the Alexa voice service, uh, which is really how to take the Alexa uh, um, capabilities and then put them into your own products. Um, and so what, what I've actually had the uh, opportunity to do in the last, say, nine months is work with various companies. If you went to the Alexa smart home booth, you probably saw some of the devices that we're building or helping to build. Um, and, uh, and embed that Alexa capability into third-party devices. Watches, uh, wireless speakers, uh, video intercoms, um, you name it, you can really bring Alexa to that uh, capability. But what's important is there's a few things that we've learned along the way in terms of how our API works and some tips and tricks uh, in terms of what to know about how that API works um, and some things to sort of keep in mind. So hopefully there'll be some, some good details in here, some things you maybe didn't notice through the docs and, and uh, we'll pick up. And, uh, and uh, if not, not, you know, obviously just a great opportunity to see sort of uh, some of the things we're doing um, in the uh, platform today. Um, so for this morning, we're gonna talk about uh, key concepts of the voice service. So uh, how many of you use the Alexa voice service today? All right, cool, all right. So a lot of folks are probably new too, and that's great. Um, and then, uh, so we'll talk about some of the tips and tricks of implementing the Alexa voice service uh, in a client. Uh, some considerations for how to think about evolving it, because of course with any um, platform or API, it's how do I build it in a way that's gonna make it future-proof? Um, and then of course some key components to hands-free, which of course many folks know, um, and of course you all now have a dot, um, so uh, many folks know, recognize that ability to talk to a device from a distance, just use the wake word and wake it up. There's some, there's some tips and tricks around how that works as well, and, and uh, Miles will jump up from Intel and talk about some of the capabilities they bring to that, um, uh, that solution as well. But first and foremost, I think it's important to start with our ecosystem. So um, obviously you probably heard the keynote on Wednesday, we're, we're uh, uh, building some capabilities that more standalone, um, like Lex and Poly, which is the sort of the core of the ASR and the NLU, autom uh, automatic speech recognition and the natural language understanding. Um, those are standalone, but the Alexa ecosystem is really um, what I'm here to talk about, which is there's two halves to it. Uh, obviously if you, if you have an Echo Dot, if you play with it um, today, then you sort of recognize that capability to play music and, and have skills like, say, Uber or Domino's, 1-800-Flowers. And that's really the, the skills kit half um, on the, on the right-hand side of the slides. So really the ability for third parties to bring their own content or capabilities to the platform. Uh, and that's, you know, obviously we have over 5,000 skills today. Um, so that's a key piece in terms of making those uh, capabilities available to uh, consumers today and bringing your own content, your own capabilities to the platform. Um, on the left-hand side is the Alexa voice service, which is then taking that same um, hands-free, uh, you know, voice-enabled uh, capability and bringing it to any product um, that you might be building and developing. All right, so if you have a new form factor, uh, a new design, a new um, you know, uh, uh, device that you want to launch, and you say, hey, I'd love to have voice control for that, I'd love to bring the Alexa capabilities to it, that's what the Alexa voice service is about. It's about bringing that capability uh, to your own designs, your own, your own hardware, um, and then expanding that ecosystem. And of course, it works together. So anything you build 
um, that you might want to put Alexa into also has access to the same skills kit that you know, the Echoes uh, have as well. So you might order a, an Uber with the Echo Dot today. Well, if you built a, a device that actually has the Alexa voice service in it, then you can access those same skills. So it's really part of a, a connected ecosystem of uh, capabilities and products um, and building that all together. Um, so that's really what this is about. Um, again, it's, it's uh, open, extensible, third parties can build it, fi over 5,000 skills, and, and obviously a growing number of, of um, hardware devices that are adding Alexa every day. So, um, so we'll, talk about, we'll talk more about that. So the intelligent cloud service is really what's behind this. Um, so you see there's a whole bunch of different pieces. Um, and this is obviously more of an eye chart um, than you know, something for you to read. Uh, but you know, if you start at, at the top level, you've really got a, a whole bunch of capabilities that sit on the device, right? You know, uh, state management, mic arrays, speakers, things like that that are part of the, you know, the core implementation of the device level, um, backed up by a, a, a platform of capabilities. So when you build um, an Alexa device, uh, you actually are connected to the cloud. Uh, a lot of things really are happening in the cloud as part of that capability. So uh, when you speak to it, you say, Alexa, it wakes up. Um, then you know, the next step is to continue you know, making your request, you know, play Dave Matthews. Right? A lot of that streams through that device uh, into the cloud, and then a lot of the analysis of the speech itself, what you're trying to access, and then what the actual intent should map to, and the, the response is actually done as part of an intelligent cloud service. Um, so it's all connected all the time as part of that platform. So you've got things like you know, orchestration around speech, you know, uh, the, the uh, orchestration with the GUI for the uh, companion application, um, primitives around you know, uh, understanding speech recognition, but then also mapping text to speech, or speech to text, I should say, um, and then finding the intent that's related to it. Those are all part of that, um, that cloud platform. Uh, and then, of course, we do a ton of work on the back end in terms of model training and improvement. So as you can imagine, as you keep talking to Alexa, we keep making it better over time, right? And that's something you get as sort of effectively for free as part of that platform. We're continually evolving and improving that platform behind the scenes. Um, and then, of course, you know, the third-party content is a, is a big piece for us. Um, you know, we see um, you know, the Alexa voice service and the skills kit, both of which are you know, royalty-free, um, you know, free-to-use capabilities as a way to tie into this big ecosystem and really make it better for you know, your customers and, and our customers is a, a, a better capability. So the third party ecosystem is huge um, for us. Things like you know, Uber, uh, Domino's, um, it says 3,000 more there, but now it's actually 5,000 more. So you know, these slides, I, I can't, I, I could maybe do a real time counter in there. We'd probably keep clicking as we sit here. Um, but uh, it's obviously continually growing as people publish new skills. And, and if you competed in the skills kit uh, competition this week, then there's probably a few more that you may be built. So um, continues to grow and evolve um, in the three-piece side. And then, of course, the, the more dedicated skills are on, like, say, the smart home. So I, you can control your lights, your thermostat. Um, you know, there's now smart locks. There's a whole variety of smart home capabilities that are being added to this ecosystem. Um, and so that's all, all part of that. And so these are all, you know, kind of that core platform. And, and up top, uh, the, the important thing for us from the Alexa voice service perspective, the team I represent, um, is that we're bringing that capability to a wide array of devices. So it's not just you know, the, Echo, um, the Echo or the Echo Dot or the Amazon Tap. It's really about bringing that same capability um, to a wide array of, of industrial designs and, and uh, form factors. So if you have a new capability, a new device type, and you'd like to add Alexa to it, that's really where the Alexa voice service comes in. So it, you know, it could be... Um, that first one looks like a hard drive, actually. Um, kind of funny. It's a speaker, though. Uh, and then a TV, and then more smartphones, watches, a wide variety of different devices that are out there today. So let's talk a little bit about how it works. Um, so obviously it starts with something you talk to. Um, in this particular case, our implementation, really more of a reference design. So when we built the Echo, our vision was that this was um, a way for uh, customers to interact with a new capability. Um, but we immediately knew that was just going to be one example. I mean, we knew that it was going to be expanding and, the, and others would be building on top of that. Um, so you can see here we've got you know, Raspberry Pi. How many of you have uh, actually uh, used a Raspberry Pi? All right. So there's a GitHub project to build a Raspberry Pi into an Alexa endpoint. Um, it takes like an hour. We actually ran some labs this week. If you didn't get a chance to get in those, I'm sorry. But 
they filled up pretty quick, but you know, it, it literally online, you know, quick, uh, quick project to go ahead and build out a, a Pi. Um, and then now you have an Alexa endpoint that you can then tweak and tune as you see fit. Um, and then of course down below you see the, uh, the Nucleus device. So this is actually a video intercom uh, capability, sort of keep the family connected, very easy way to, to uh, you know, tap and make a video call. Um, but you know, as, as they built that product out, they recognized, hey, it'd be nice if I had Alexa as part of that. I can use the Alexa wake word and then go ahead and play music or control my lights. Um, and that's embedded in that product. Um, so all those individual products call the same platform effectively, right? So they all talk back to the Alexa cloud service or intelligent um, capability, intelligent service there. And behind it, there's a few big pieces that are kind of part of this whole ecosystem that are constantly evolving and improving. Um, the first is ASR, so um, automated speech recognition. So it takes that audio stream, processes it, and maps it to actual words. You know, it, obviously it's language dependent. Um, Alexa today uh, speaks um, American English, uh, British English, and uh, uh, German, you know, from Germany, as you'd imagine. Um, so, uh, so those are the three languages that are part of that platform today, and we're going to continue to evolve that, that capability. Um, but first is that mapping from the, the audio stream to an actual set of words. Now, those words are just words, right? They, they map to individual you know, uh, aspects of the English language. But then you need to do the next, lang next piece, which is really the natural language understanding, which is what do those words mean? So you, know, you could say, uh, play Dave Matthews, play the Dave Matthews, uh, you know, play some songs by Dave Matthews. All those things are effectively the same thing, but they're different ways to express it. So there's, a, there's an aspect of natural language understanding, which is taking those words and then mapping them to an actual intent. And that's what NLU is really about. There's a whole engine behind that. Um, and then, of course, you know, once uh, we've analyzed what you actually are trying to say and, and want, we map that to uh, any, any wide array of skills. Some of those are built in, things like music, um, mapping to music services. Um, some of those are third party skills. So Uber is a third party skill, but um, you know, music is, is a primary skill. So we do that NLU ma analysis and then end up with a, a, a skill mapping. We get a response from that skill. Um, here's what you want to say back. Here's the directive you should send down the device. Here's the music you should play. Here's the content you should play. Um, and then it, there's a text-to-speech portion, which is where there's a, a you know, and you've seen the, the poly announcement. Um, so poly is kind of that text-to-speech engine, a, a voice behind it. Alexa has a very distinctive voice. So when you use the Alexa voice service, you get the exact same voice and characteristics as the, the Echo devices, right? So it's, it's the same uh, identity, if you will, um, of Alexa. So that's our text-to-speech capability. And of course, obviously, you know, uh, uh, big data, machine learning, analytics are, are kind of core to the Amazon Web Services platform, so we use them a lot here as well to improve that speech recognition, to improve the mapping of words to an actual intent. So those are all core to the platform and, and pieces that are all involved. All right, so the real question at this point is, you know, what are you going to build that ties into that? Um, and obviously, we'll talk more about um, what's, what's behind that. Um, and of course, you know, what have others built? Um, there's a few announcements we made recently. I'm not going to read all the slide. Um, lots of, lots of uh, things coming. And of course, there's lots more you know, coming in the future. So uh, you know, we mentioned the Nucleus, the video intercom, you know, Pebble Core. Uh, you know, there's there's uh, even like tap to talk you know, uh, uh, devices you can wear kind of on your, on your messenger bag as you're traveling. Hit a, hit a button, say, hey, what's on my calendar um, with the Onyx. Um, Sonos has pre-announced uh, sort of a whole home audio management. Um, capability, you can talk to your Echo Dot and then have it direct audio to your kitchen Sonos speakers. Um, all those things are part of that. Um, we've got several watchmakers, um, Omate and Co-Watch, um, both of which are Android watches. So you know you can ask it what time it is. Kind of an odd question to ask a watch, but you could do that. Um, <laughs> you can also ask what's in your calendar, which is probably more appropriate. Um, and then, and even smart home hubs, you know, where the smart home hub maybe manages a variety of of, um, of devices. Um, you know, with say Z-Wave or Zigbee or various other protocols, but then on top of that also has that voice capability. And, uh, and even the, the Tri-B, which is, uh, you know, kind of more of a kitchen reminder, um, you know, phone call capability. So a wide variety of devices, and of course, you know, the, one of the core uh, visions we have for that Alexa voice service is that, you know, Amazon obviously innovates, but we, the big piece is we want to actually make it available for others to, to build on top. 
So this is where you can add Alexa to a variety of products. And many of these have their own capabilities, like the Nucleus is a, is a fantastic video intercom system, something that, you know, that we don't do, but then you can bring Alexa to that and expand it and make it um, even more capable. Um, now, the first tip, since this was called tips and tricks, I, I should probably give you at least one or two. Um, so the first tip I would say is if you're going to use the Alexa voice service, um, I would really start with our sample app. Um, and the reason why I say that is because, well, there's a lot of things moving there, a lot of things going on. It seems fairly simple as a concept. You, know, you, make, you, you speak to the device, you stream some audio up, you get, some, you, know, you get a response back and play that audio. But there's a fair amount of, of various interactions going on underneath the covers. Um, so the first thing I would probably start with is we have a, a great Java sample app um, that really outlines the entire um, uh, capability. If you were to build a, an, if you were to build your own, say, Echo Dot today, uh, we've implemented the entire API as a client side for you as a Java sample app. So I'd start there because it, it really highlights a lot of the capabilities and what what it takes to really build this entire um, platform or capability. Um, the nice thing, of course, about the sample app is it's, it's a Java-based client. So as I mentioned earlier, there's the Pi, but you could run this, and in fact, I, I run this um, on my laptop um, as a way to quickly test out new skills or capabilities. I just you know, plug my headphones in the side and, and run the Java client app, and I have a, an Alexa endpoint in my PC. Right? I, I use Windows. Don't, don't hate me. Um, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a wide variety of capabilities there. PC, Lag, uh, uh, Linux, Mac, um, the Raspberry Pi chip, Intel Edison will, will work as well. Um, and, uh, and it actually now includes a complete hands-free implementation on the Pi example. So if you go to the GitHub project today, um, there's even a wake word engine. You can wake it up with the Alexa wake word. So that's a great start point um, to really get going. A big piece of it is really about how it shows that message flow. Um, and I'll talk more about this message flow in a minute. But it, it's really about how those messages go back and forth, directives in terms of what you're supposed to do in events in terms of what's happening on that client. Um, and so that you can capture that whole capability as part of the application log. Um, and then, of course, another example based in there is really all of our companion apps. So how do you link this? As you can imagine, you have to link these devices to your Amazon account. Um, so the whole login with Amazon, implementation, how you link it to your account, um, getting permissions to, to uh, generate a token that you use to call the service. So it's all embedded in the sample. Um, and of course, it's the first stop for all debugging questions. So let's say you're building an embedded Linux. You want to write everything in C++. I'd start with this, you know, this Java sample app and then work from there. Um, and so at that point, now we're sort of diving in a little bit. It did, it did get labeled as a 300 talk, so we should at least have one architecture slide. Um, so uh, now that we're diving in a little bit, there's a whole bunch of parts, if you will, to this, this overall architecture. I'll just let you read this, and I'll just stand here for a bit. All right, I'll, I'll talk about it. Um, so uh, you know, the, big, the big pieces are, as we talked about, there's the companion app in the bottom right. And that's really how do you link, how do you generate a, a token? And that's how do you get permissions for the device that you've registered. Um, with Amazon, how do you get permissions for that device to call the AVS service? And then on top of that also, how do you link it to an Amazon account for a user? All right, two separate things. One, how do I generate an identity for my device? And then number two, how do I generate a token that can call uh, to the service on a particular user's behalf to access their information? So do they have Prime? Um, are, are they linked, you know, is their account linked to various other skills or capabilities, right? That's all tied into that um, platform. So there's companion apps, which, which could be completely standalone, and we have Android, iOS, and, and just Node.js examples. Um, but on top of that, it could be embedded in the, the device itself, all part of that. Um, and then uh, top right is the, sort of the magic, and I'll talk more about that later, which is the magic of the wake word. The wake word is a separate thing. So when you have an echo, um, an echo in your house or an echo dot, there's a process running at all times. It's listening for its name. You know, just like you're sitting here listening for your name, uh, waiting for somebody to call on you. Um, yeah, <laughs> the same thing with the, the Alexa devices. Um, there's a process running. It's a wake word agent that's running as a process. So when we talk about the, the Echo, uh, the Echo Dot, uh, it is, uh, it's listening for its name, Alexa. There's three names, Alexa, Echo, or Amazon. It's listening for one of those names, and when it hears it, that's when it wakes up. That's when the light ring lights up, and then it starts streaming the audio. Before that, it's doing nothing other than just listening for its name. Right? So there's a process that's part of this. If you want to do hands-free, um, that is a, a wake word um, agent running at all times. 
Um, and then the client itself has a few big pieces. There's a, sort of a, an attention system. So if you look at the um, echo, there's the light ring. Um, you know, it lights up when you say its name. You can see whether it's processing, what's going on, which mic is active by, based on how the light ring's lit up. You see it's kind of like a lighter color where the, where the mic that's active is listening. All those things are kind of part of that attention system, and whatever device you build would have something akin to that. Um, there's also obviously a microphone. Right? That would be expected, right? Um, and then there's a few core pieces to the platform itself. So uh, in this Java sample app, there's a controller which handles invoking various components of the architecture, whether it be um, alerts, so you set a timer and alert fires. Um, it's going to invoke the alert management um, capabilities. If you're playing audio, it's going to you know, feed audio out to the audio player, um, which is an interface, but then ties back to an actual local um, device um, capability from an audio player perspective. Um, so it's kind of a controller that maps to, to sort of send the messages around. Um, and then the key pieces on the left side, one, alert management. Is an alarm firing? Is it not firing? Has it been canceled, not canceled? All those key, key things. And that's actually done locally on the device. So if you set an alarm, um, it'll fire even if you lose internet connection. Right? So that's a key aspect of it. It has to keep track of that alarm because you don't want an alarm to be lost just because you lost the internet. Right? So uh, alarm management is a key part of this, um, or alert management. And then the audio player, which is a core component for streaming audio, but even just playing the news. So when you say, what's my flash briefing? Um, that's actually part of the audio player. It's working through multiple podcasts or, or even just multiple streams of MP3 content um, to go ahead and play that back out to the user. So there's an audio player component that works through the, the playlist, if you will. Um, and then all those things tie into um, sort of the, the blue items, as, we, uh, as highlighted by the, the um, legend there, are things that are kind of either native or third parties. So like, there's going to be a native capability for timers and alarms, right? So in some cases, let's say it's a phone app, there might be a, a tied in a, a native uh, phone capability for alarms and setting those alarms, right? Um, in the Echo devices, it's obviously built into the, the actual hardware there, but you know, if you tie it into a, an existing platform, um, there might be already um, native timer and alarm capabilities. So you want to tie into that native system. Um, there's a native media player, right? So, um, you know, if you're, depending on the device you're running on, you might have a, a you know, Android media player, you might have VLC, GStreamer, any variety of native players that are running on the device, um, and then that audio output capability. Um, and then there's that messaging layer that ties it all together. So the events and directives go in and out. So events are things that are happening on the system. So, uh, you know, audio playback's been paused, um, you know, the alarm is firing, things that are happening locally versus directives, which is the service telling you what to do next. You know, play this stream, uh, you know, set this alarm you know, capabilities. So they're kind of back and forth, um, you know, capabilities that, that are based on that. Um, and a core component is really connection management. So the whole um, uh, platform uh, is really based on HTTP2, um, which is, uh, if you think about it, it's, it's a up channel or a, a synchronous uh, um, back and forth channel as well as a down channel that exists. So there's two parts to it. Uh, you build a channel for making requests, and you actually maintain another channel that actually re receives messages. So I don't know if you've ever played with your, your um, uh, dot yet, if you plugged it into your hotel room, but you can actually, in the companion app, you know, pause playback, you know, change the volume, uh, cancel timers. All those things can happen completely outside of your local client. So we have a down channel capability as part of the architecture. So you can send messages to the device. So a complete implementation of AVS also has a HTTP2 down channel for communications, um, both a audio stream in and out, but also then server-driven interactions coming back down to the device. So as you can see, there's a, a few pieces to this uh, platform and architecture, and, and really, it's, it's kind of a, it's not necessarily a traditional API in the sense that um, it's a whole bunch of individual you know, calls or, or um, requests to a, 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 you know, a platform. But more, it's actually really in many ways uh, a, a state machine and a message bus and an API all in one, right? <laughs> so, so the state machine is like, what's playing? What's happening? What's the interaction right now? What channel is playing? Um, the message bus is those events and directives going back and forth. And the API is really, how am I sending those, those pieces back and forth, the events and directives? So, um, in most cases, most of the interaction you're building or designing is really around this events um, endpoint. I'm sending events, like playback started, 
playback nearly finished, playback finished, you know, in sort of receiving that. On the back channel, in terms of what's coming down from the server, is directives, right? And then there's kind of a ping to keep that connection open. Those are the core API components. Um, but what you're getting is on top of that endpoint is a whole bunch of individual types of messages. Um, so those messages really are, are much more of a message bus, like, you know, fire this alarm, set this alarm, uh, you know, uh, play this uh, music, uh, you know, and it, it, you're continually receiving a stream of, of messages on the, on the down channel or even the response to your request. So it's a bit of a message bus implementation on top of an API endpoint. And then, of course, there's that state machine, which is, is music playing right now? So when alarm fires, do I need to duck the audio for the music so I can fire the alarm? Do I need to pause uh, playback so I can go ahead and, uh, and deal with a, a more important event like uh, Alexa speaking, right? So there's kind of, a, if you will, a, an architecture around um, a, events uh, and a state machine on top. So it has a few parts to it, so it can be a little challenging. So what that means is um, it's really important if you're building a client to take a more of a phased approach, right? If you were to build a brand new device, what I'd recommend is you start with taking that sample app. Um, take what's there and move it over to your platform and, and see what happens. You know, so try and get it working in that environment, right, as a first step. Um, <clears throat> integrating with native components, switching out libraries is appropriate. So, for example, our architecture uh, in the Java sample is built on um, Jetty, but if you were moving to an Android device, for example, you might move to OKHttp, OK right? So HTTP2 libraries need to be swapped out, maybe media players need to be swapped out, things like that to sort of make that run. The next step would be uh, to harden it um, from a production capability. So it's a sample app, what we provide. So it's not, you know, it's not something you would just drop into a device and say, hey, it's ready for prime time. Um, things around uh, you know, uh, device management, around deploying updates, an OTA strategy, um, things like that for updating the device um, in the field are all important things. Um, logging and events um, are important to capture what's happening in the device itself. And then, should it be appropriate for your particular architecture, think about a hands-free strategy. So our API and our endpoint is really much more about the, um, uh, the calling into the service and streaming the audio back and forth, but it's not about that wake word and the local device um, wake up capabilities. So that's not included in our platform today. Um, there's a whole bunch of partners that make things in that space, and, and Intel will be up in a minute to talk more about how they make that easier. Um, but, uh, but that's the other aspect is how do I, after I've gotten this thing working in a, a push to talk scenario, how do I bring it to a hands free and make that magic happen, right? So that's kind of the three step uh, process I'd, I'd recommend. Um, now, the next thing is, uh, as we talked about with the sample app, is um, it, it's really that's where you start to understand the architecture. And a big piece of that is really le learning to love the logs. And uh, we actually have very verbose logs built into the sample app to sort of help you understand what's going on under the covers. Um, and there's a couple examples here just to give you a sense of, of what's happening. Um, so this is captured straight out of the, the Java logs for the, the sample app. And so this is a classic um, streaming audio call. So I've, in this scenario, I've said, you know, what's the weather? All right. um, that's actually a speech recognizer dot recognize event. I've asked the service to say, hey, can you recognize this audio I'm streaming to you? Um, in this particular scenario, we generally send up, uh, the recommendation is to send up 320 byte chunks, so 10 milliseconds of audio or thereabouts, as a regular kind of streaming capability. And this is one example of an event that gets fed up. So you're gonna see a whole bunch of this in the logs in terms of this is how audio gets streamed in, this is how the API is called. And like I said, it's, it's um, more of a, a message bus, so these are all going to the same endpoint, um, but the event itself in this particular case is a um, is a speech recognizer dot recognize event. Um, and so you'll send more, you know, multiples of those along the process to then feed that audio to the service. Um, and what's important here is you get a variety of things that help you track what's going on. One, there's that thread up top. Um, as you can imagine, in this kind of a model, you got a multi-threaded architecture. Um, you know, there's obviously the GUI front end, there's the streaming of the audio, there's, there's the, um, the down, down channel itself. So tracking which event is happening on which thread is important. The logs will help you with that. Um, and then, of course, the event information itself and then message IDs. So you should, you know, should something go wrong, this is how you track like, which message it was, what's happening. Um, and you see here, this is the, uh, the close talk profile. Um, that's one example. We have multiple profiles, near field, far field, and close talk. Close talk is the push to talk scenario. Near field is you know, within five feet. 
and far field is then beyond five feet. So all those are, are definitions you can make as part of that event as you, as you call into the API. Um, so those are all kind of important core aspects, but this is where the sample apps are gonna really help out. Oh, whoops, I went backwards. And now I'm going forwards. Um, uh, so the, the next piece is what comes back from that, right? So now that you've fired up an event, you're gonna get directives back. So in this particular case, this is a, a speak directive, which is telling your uh, particular device to go ahead and actually say something. Um, most of uh, Alexa's responses are come down as embedded MP3 audio inside the message. So you'll get a speak directive and there'll be an offset for a payload of an MP3 that's embedded in there, which is the audio to say, right? Um, so, uh, so in this particular case, you'll get a directive. There's the request ID information, um, and it says speak this, and here's your message ID. Now, what's important is these messages obviously tie to various interfaces. This is speak, there's other directives for say play, for like playback, um, stop for stopping playback, things like that. So they're all core to the API. So again, like I was saying earlier, this is really that message bus component. Directives are fe being fed down to you as do this, do that. Um, and then you actually have to sort of decide which is more important. We have a definition around what channels are most important. So for example, speak directives are gonna be more important than play directives, because this is Alexa saying something, it's, it's critical. Whereas playing music is a, a lower channel, so therefore, if Alexa wants to say something, you let her speak while you pause the audio um, for the play directive. So there's kind of a, a, a state machine on, on top of this as well. So let's talk about how that kind of works. Um, so there's some complex sequences in the platform, and so there's a few of these are, are mostly the most challenging, if you will, if you're implementing your own client from scratch. Um, the first is multi-turn, right? So let's say you, you said to Alexa, you know, set a timer. Um, she would come back and actually tell you, you know, for how long. She'd ask you, how long do you want it set for? So she's gonna send you a speak directive to actually say that. Um, but on top of that, um, she's then gonna send you an expect speech directive, which is the, so say this, but then open your microphone again to get a response. So this is what we call multi-term. So you'll see this in her examples with timers. Skills can do this as well. So uh, for example, if you, you know, if you want to order an Uber, it's going to ask you, you know, it's going to validate your address. The, here's the location. So any skill could do this as well. So this is a core piece of, of a client is to handle that back and forth, um, you know, communication. Um, so in this particular case, the speak directive is coming back. Um, and then, you know, the speech has started. We, we actually do have a whole bunch of events around letting Alexa or the platform know if you've said the speech, did it finish? Um, so it can actually then uh, give you the next thing if there's more speech to, to come. Um, but then in this particular case, um, it's feeding that out to your audio player. So um, uh, it's capturing that MP3, it's writing it down to a temporary file, it's then streaming it to the audio player which goes out um, to the speaker and then of course the microphone is opened again um, on the left hand side and then you say 10 minutes and then you send up another recognized event. So this is part of that back and forth kind of message bus model um, that actually is part of the, the platform itself. So important to think about, really not so much as an API, it's really more of a message bus of uh, directives and events going back and forth. The other one that, uh, and of course this is then the next step of what, what does an alarm look like. Um, so the other piece is then, uh, there's often many directives that come from not just uh, the speak itself, but then other things that are coming on, not just the response, but also the down channel. So you see here, it's very similar to the first example, but the difference is um, now you're actually getting a set alert directive, not just speak, but now it's saying, hey, you need to set alarm. Um, so that's actually in purple, uh, and of course, you know, international standards dictate that purple is the down channel. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you knew that, purple is the down channel. Um, that's not true, by the way, just, just a tip. Um, uh, so, uh, so the set alert directive actually comes back down on the down channel, um, and that's actually a separate channel that's maintained, not just the synchronous response from the HTTP request, but a separate HTTP2 down channel that's sending that in. So then you're getting an alert directive in that case, and then of course, you know, the AVS controller interface, as we talked about earlier, is then setting that alert um, in the alert manager itself. Uh, in the Java sample, it just uses the local disk, and it just writes it out to save it for later. Um, if you were to build this, say, as an Android device or, um, you know, as, a, as even a standalone C++ embedded client, um, you would own kind of the process of how do I capture and store that alert information so that I can fire it later 
uh, as appropriate. Um, the sample app actually does the timer and just fires it as a, as a thread, basically, on a timer. Um, but obviously, as the timer fires, you see um, you know, the set alert is succeeded, but then the timer fires as time passes. And then you've, you've got the client saying, hey, the alert's firing, the alert's in the foreground. Um, it's all really part of that communication back and forth between the device and the platform, or what's actually happening locally on the, on the, on the device. Um, and then, of course, the most, um, you know, the most common scenario is a lot of folks wanting to play you know, music, of course. So when you say, Alexa, you know, play classical music, obviously you're going to send a recognize event. I got the dots there, because you know, if I try to put every message back and forth, I wouldn't have enough slide room. Um, so um, you'd send the recognize event to say, hey, I want to play some music. And what you're going to get back is, uh, in this particular case, a play directive. So as you can see, there's a variety of directives, and they'll keep expanding over time. Um, but there's a variety of directives. In this case, a play directive, which tells you, hey, go hit this endpoint. Um, in that case, Amazon Music. Right? So we don't stream the music directly through the AVS service. We give you streaming URLs that you then go hit other endpoints. So that could be TuneIn or iHeartRadio or Amazon Music. Um, those are all uh, individual um, uh, streaming endpoints. And we give you that play directive as a response. Now, what's interesting about music is it actually has a, a couple additional capabilities. Beyond just the play directive, you then let, of course, the platform know playback started. But then you actually give progress reports. So there's two types of progress reports in here. One is a, uh, what's called a progress report delay elapsed event, which is an awesome name. Um, uh, and what that says is you know, when you get a play directive, you're told, hey, after a certain amount of time, let us know if you're still playing. And part of that is really about uh, reporting, uh, reporting that the music's been played, how long it's been played. Um, and then we capture that and, of course, feed it on to the content providers themselves. Um, so it's part of that uh, progress reporting to, you know, obviously tracking what music's been played. Um, and that's part of the core requirement of music certification. Um, so there's two types of events. One is delayed. So it's been playing for 30 seconds or a minute. Let us know. And then there's also this other idea, which is progress report interval elapsed, which is tell us every 30 seconds if you're still playing. So you'll get in that play directive uh, information about what you need to send and how often. And you'll have to set threads to go ahead and keep reporting events. Like, hey, I'm still playing, still playing this song. It's still going every 30 seconds or just one time. So it's kind of part of that, the music interface is really to also even track what music's being played on the device and how long you've been playing it. So we can report that back to the, the content providers themselves. Um, and then as you, know, as you go through a song, you'll get to, you know, uh, the song's almost over. You're close. It's a three-minute song, and you're about 2.50 in, 2.30 in. You send a playback nearly finished. And what we'll do is actually then immediately send you the next song. So here's the next song you need to play, if there is one. If, it just, if you picked one song, then you're not going to get anything to, uh, to play next. But if you've picked a playlist, for example, we'll send you the next play directive as a response to that. Here's the next thing to queue up so you get started. Um, oftentimes, uh, you can even send this early so you can start uh, buffering that content, that next piece of, of music. Um, and then once that song's finished, you let us know playback's finished. And of course, you have that play directive. You can keep going to the next thing. And that's obviously, as you imagine, this is a, a pretty much a loop. It just keeps going around and around and around as you play a long list of, of music. All right. So what's important now with music is, of course, it's you know we are providing you access to music content. So a lot of the, there's a lot of formats to deal with. So there's a whole bunch of codecs to sort of build in there. Um, this is a quick list. Um, uh, of, the, of the core codecs we see from our music services. And as we add more music capabilities, we'll see more of these over time. Um, but you know, AAC, MP4, MP3, you know, our, our common HLS for uh, more streaming, um, PLS. Um, you know, we even have a, a playlist as the M3U format. So you see a wide variety of things. So one of the key considerations when building out a device is how am I going to support this variety of codecs on that device? Um, what do I need to, to, to uh, purchase or consume or build into that device for handling these various codecs? So, um, and you need to support all those. Um, and obviously, playlists as well is a, is a key uh, differentiator from, from beyond just individual music formats, but also even playlist formats. So let's talk quickly about the state machine um, behind this audio player, because this is, a, this is one where a lot of people uh, kind of get lost, so it's important to, to, to handle it. So you obviously, you start in your idle state. Um, you're not playing anything. 
after you uh, start playing, you get a play directive, you move into the playing state, right? In playing, you're going to get a directive, like play this, right? You're going to get that information. Um, and as you play, obviously, you'll say playback started, playback finished, you'll be progress reporting events are part of that. Um, but it's important to realize that while you're playing, you actually also have to keep track of, a, of a, the various channels of different types of content. So Alexa's voice is a dialogue channel, right? So if she wants to pop in and say something, if she says, hey, this, you know, OK, or responds to you in some way, question you asked, that's a dialogue channel, which is the most important, right? So if you're playing music, you've got to pause that while Alexa speaks to you. Um, the next most important from a dialogue or channel perspective is the alerts. So let's say you set an alarm for 10 minutes, and you're in the middle of playing a song. The alarm fires. You've got to pause that audio while you play uh, that alert and the alarm. right? And then the third is really that content. So at all times while you're in this playing state, you're actually keeping track of what channels of, of content are actually being um, delivered, and then which one actually takes precedence. So this is the this is the, this is the uh, the the state machine on top of of the message bus. The what's playing and what should I be playing it right now? Um, and then of course once you finish, as I said, once you finish playing something, you're going to get that next play directive and keep moving. Now, if the uh, if uh, you go into say the companion app um, or there's a button on your device to pause, um, you can let uh, the service know, hey, I, I'm in, currently in a pause state. It's also, pause state is commonly used when uh, you're getting a, a, an alert firing. So an alert's firing, you have to pause your audio playback while that alert fires, so you have to move into this pause state. Um, so it, it's not so much a voice-driven interaction, but rather uh, other channels are interrupting or you're using a button on the device itself. Um, so, and then when you, you let the platform know, hey, playback's paused, and when you're ready to go, keep going, you, you resume. Um, much more common is, hey, I say to my device, you know, Alexa, stop. And that'll move me into that stop state. Um, and here, you've got, a, it's either a voice command, or you can even use the companion app. So this is where that down channel is important, because um, you can actually stop playback, not just with voice, but you can also stop it from the Alexa companion app on any device. So if you built a, you know, a watch tomorrow and you were you know, um, playing music on it, you should be able to pause that or stop that playback from the companion app and send a message to the device. So you have to sort of interact with that in a variety of different ways, both voice as well as um, driven by the server. And so whenever that continues or should continue, you're going to get a play directive to move back up into the playing state. And then last um, is you finished, right? You finished the playlist. You've got no more events in the queue. The queue is empty. Um, now you're finished playback. You let the platform know. Um, and then there's no more play directives coming down, so you stop, right? And in many ways, you know, finished and idle are uh, similar in a sense that you're not actually, nothing's happening. So the minute you get a play directive, you move back into play, right? So that's kind of the, the general uh, state machine. There's a much more detailed version of this in our docs. Um, but it's definitely important to study because it's, it's one of the key pieces of how to make all this stuff work seamlessly is really tracking how that state machine's functioning and where you're at. Um, the most um, uh, important thing beyond all that is we're going to keep changing this, right? We're going to keep adding and, and, and delivering new capabilities. And so you need to really plan around this sort of future-proof architecture. And a uh, few things that are important to remember. Um, events and directives, they can come at any time. They can come in any order. We don't make statements about specific order. They generally follow a pretty good order, and you'll see that in the sample app. Um, but they could pop up at different times. Obviously, with the companion app capabilities, we could be sending directives at different times. So it's important to sort of really not uh, code anything that it takes order into consideration. Um, and we can add new ones. So, you know, obviously, if you've worked with Amazon for more than an hour and a half, then you know we keep innovating, we keep adding new things. So we're going to add new stuff. So as we do, you want to make sure you drop anything you don't know about on the floor. Because it's not, you, you just let it go, and, uh, and maybe you change your client over time to, you know, add this new capability. But if you see something new you're not aware of, just drop it and, and don't fail out. Um, that's important. Message formats. We generally are more additive. We never take things out or change the meanings. So you should, if you see something in the JSON you're not used to, again, let it go, and then improve your client over time. Um, and then, of course, uh, an important part of this is, is really if you're building a device, you really have to have a good OTA strategy. You have to, you know, over the air updates are super critical. Um, things are going to change, and, and even your client's going to get better and improve. So really having planned up front a good OTA strategy for how you're going to update and improve that real time in the field is, is a, a critical thing. Um, now, what's important here, and I'm going to touch on this for like two seconds and turn it to Miles, 
is uh, now, this is, that was all about the client, um, which is how to interact with the service, whether it's push to talk or hands-free, but hands-free adds a whole other um, capability. So how do I wake up this device? How do I have that magic of you know, yelling across the room, hey, Alexa, you know, do this? Um, and that's a, a key component. Um, we have a whole bunch of, uh, of, of partners that help out with that, and there's a few big pieces, um, and, and Intel will talk more about their solutions. There's a few big pieces that are important to recognize and hands-free, which is really local. And the big things are, you know, what's my mic array? What's it gotta be in terms of the distance I wanna communicate to it? The Echo has a seven mic array. You can talk to it from across the room. Is that really the user experience I want for my device? How do I, how do I bring the right mic array for the right um, distance communication I want? Um, echo cancellation is how do I subtract out the audio? So if I'm playing music, I don't want that music to feed back into the mic and actually get confused with the user's interaction. How do I subtract it out? And that's what echo cancellation is about. Um, and then wake word spotting. How do I recognize its name? How does it know it's Alexa? How do I wake it up? Um, and then beam forming. If you have multiple mics, you'll notice on the echo, it'll light up a part of the ring, which is the mic that's active. Um, it actually identifies which mic has the best signal. So that's a beam forming capability, which is important for a multi-mic array. And noise reduction. So if you, there's any way to sort of cancel out some of the echoes or bouncing around the room to clean up that audio signal, that's an important piece as well. But here to talk more about uh, uh, solutions that, that make this a lot easier, because we don't provide the wake word pieces today, um, is, uh, is Miles Kingston from Intel. He's going to tell you more about uh, Intel's uh, support in that space, as well as their, their strategy around smart home and more. Thanks, Miles. Great. Well, I have to reiterate, I am really impressed to see all of your faces today, uh, not only for a 9.30 class, but a 9.30 technical session. I've been sitting in the front row, definitely having flashbacks to my Chemistry 101 class, freshman year of college, 8 a.m., dreaded that thing. So thank you all for being here. Uh, as Matt said, my name is Miles Kingston. I'm the general manager of Smart Home at, at Intel. I'm really happy to be here for three reasons. One, I want to tell you a bit about uh, the partnership between Intel and Amazon that's lasted over 10 years. It's been fantastic. Two, um, I want to share some capabilities and expertise we have in the hardware space. And I didn't see how many of you are hardware developers, but we have a lot of tools that we want to extend to both Amazon and all of you to help you create your own products running Alexa voice services. And then thirdly, I'm actually a huge user of this technology myself at home. Um, I actually have 13 Echoes in my house. I will have 14 once I bring my swag home. When I tell a lot of people this, they kind of scoff and roll their eyes and yeah, you're just a tech geek, but here's the deal. I'm a smart home guy. I've invested a lot of time and money in the infrastructure in my house to be able to control the lights, to be able to control the Wi-Fi, the thermostats, the sprinklers, and my use case used to be to use it on my phone. Now, this was great when I went on an extended vacation. I wanted a spoof that I was home and I would turn my lights on and off at times, etc. When I was in the house, I didn't actually use it that much. It was much easier to just go and turn the lights on myself. Then the Echo came along, integrated with all of those services, and now I could do all of those things in my house from my voice. And once you have that experience, you don't want to do it from one room in your house that you're, you know, or one space that you're 12 feet away. You want to do it from everywhere in your house. So now I have these things scattered in every room and in every corner of the house so that I can control that infrastructure with voice, and it's a much better experience. So excited to be here to talk about all of these things. So as I mentioned, I want to talk a little bit about the partnership. So again, the partnership started a little bit over 10 years ago. It started primarily with the Amazon Web Services team. Uh, Intel's been creating custom silicon for Amazon Web Services for quite some time that have been integrated into their data centers. Uh, we've created developer kits uh, so the developers such as yourself can create innovative prototypes and plug them into the AWS IoT services. Um, and then, like I said, most recently, probably the last year, we've been working closely with Alexa Voice Services and the Alexa Skills Kit team. Um, one of the outputs of that, hopefully you had a chance to go to the park before the party uh, last night to see the Intel Amazon Tiny Home, where we basically put together a simulated home environment with some of these smart home capabilities that you can actually do today. So it's been really great partnering with them. Um, what's also great about the collaboration is just a shared customer passion. I mean, you've all read, you know, Amazon wants to be the most customer-centric company in the world, and they're absolutely doing that. At Intel, we have been innovating for the last 50 years, constantly dry pushing the envelope for the betterment of consumers. So we all have a passion for the customer. World-class supply chain. So I must admit my speaking point here for Intel got trumps this week. So I'm really impressed. We ship hundreds of millions of processors everywhere in the world. We can get a million processors dropped on pretty much any square inch of the earth, you know, at a very quick turnaround time. 
I had dinner Tuesday night at Morale Steakhouse, uh, 10 p.m. There was a table outside uh, eating on the veranda. It got a little bit chilly. A few folks were complaining about it. So one of the folks sitting at the table who was an Amazon employee got out his phone, went on Prime Now, had eight Christmas sweaters delivered in 45 minutes to the veranda of the steakhouse so that they could all be warmer. So I thought that was pretty amazing. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the capabilities we have. This is not a brag session. This is just what I found is a lot of people here at Intel, they think processors, they don't th really know some of the full capabilities we have that, again, we're extending to Amazon to help, and we want to extend to all of you so that you can bring new hardware and software running Alexa voice services. I'm going to start with uh, form factor reference designs. So if you saw Rohit's Alexa State of the Union keynote on Wednesday, uh, my boss Gregory Bryant came on stage and held up a form factor reference design for a smart speaker made by Pegatron. So form factor reference design work is something we've been doing for decades. And the reason we do it is we try to partner with an ODM or an original development manufacturer like Pegatron to go and tackle 80 to 90 percent of the challenges of bringing a product to market. We will then take this and make it widely available as a developer kit so that if you are interested in making your own product, but the idea of making something like an Echo is too daunting, we've tried to tackle 90% of those challenges for you. And again, we can then provide that to you and work with you to help bring it to market. So we do lots of reference designs and we're gonna continue to do many new reference designs integrating new differentiated hardware. Now, if you are a larger developer um, and you make quite a bit of product, we have a program called the ODM Reference System. So this is, again, we love acronyms at Intel, so we call this ORS. So what ORS is, is we literally go to Taiwan and we go to China and we go partner with the largest ODMs there and we develop uh, university level classes where we basically bring our latest and greatest technology and processing, memory, cameras, you name it, and we teach them how to build innovative products using our differentiated hardware. And then once we've done that, all of these ODMs can then go and spread to all of their customer base to help scale this technology. So this is a tool we can apply to this market as well. Uh, next, we have an innovation excellence program. This is something we've done a lot in the PC space, I would say over the last six or seven years. This is when we'll partner with the PC customers and literally co-develop products from the ground up. We'll send you know, dozens, hundreds of our engineers to their facilities to develop these things and we'll welcome them into ours on projects that are extremely of, you know, of strategic interest for both of us. And again, the example I use for this one is if you think of your laptop six years ago versus your laptop today, dramatic change. They're no longer an inch and a half, they're no longer six pounds, they're 4K, they're half an inch, they're one pound of the 10 hour battery life. A lot of that innovation was driven through these excellence programs. Then there's the uh, standard influence, and this isn't necessarily, you know, super sexy or anything like that, but, you know, where Intel has been successful in the past is driving, you know, hardware building blocks that people can innovate around. So we've been very involved in standards such as USB in the 80s, HDMI in the 90s, DVI, and most recently, OCF. So OCF is the Open Continuum Foundation. This is a standards body and a spec that is really trying to um, improve the interoperability of all of these devices in the home and kind of break down some of the vertical silos so that all of these products can work well together. Now lastly, the one I wanted to chat about, and many of you are probably not aware we do this type of thing, but ethnographic research. So very specific to smart home, which is kind of my, my expertise, we have had senior ethnographers for the last two years going into over a thousand homes in North America, China, and Western Europe, uh, spending time in people's homes to truly understand the pain points that they're having and to understand what type of new technologies and capabilities Intel can bring to the table to help resolve. So we do a lot of that work as well, and those, those use cases and those consumer pain points usually end up being our kind of our beacon for where we want to go and invest. Okay, so now tips and tricks, like Matt said. So I'm going to share some tips and tricks on the hardware side. I have to do a quick public service announcement. Uh, I'm actually a recovering engineer, so some of the stuff I'm gonna walk through here is a bit above my, you know, my technical competence here, so if I start talking about flux capacitors or anything, I apologize in advance. Um, so let's talk about this. So a lot of times when people think about personal assistance, they immediately go to speech. That, that's extremely critical, but to have a true natural you know, interaction with a personal as, uh, assistant, the quality of the input is equally as important as the quality of the output. 
you know, it's more, it's much more complicated than just having a couple speaker or excuse me, a couple microphones and a good speaker. That's not going to give you a good experience. And like Matt was talking about before, remember, you want to talk to this thing from 10, 15 feet away. It's not like you're talking to a device six inches away. That adds a lot of complexity. So if I were to have an echo at the end of this, this, uh, you know, deck here and asked a question may come out of my mouth at 90 decibels. By the time it got to the echo, it's probably 50 decibels. So then Alexa has to go and do all the noise cancellation on a much more quieter signal respond back to me and then similarly I'm 10 to 15 feet away so by the time the response gets to me it's a much you know lower volume so there's a lot of challenges we have to uncover so let's go into each one of these so if we talk about audio you know this is simply what you hear from these devices um, we've been investing a lot in this space for many years in the laptop and all-in-one space where we've wanted to improve the audio in a space constrained device so we've done a lot of work um, in speaker amplification tuning capabilities etc um, uh, to make sure that we can get, you know, jaw-dropping audio out of small form factor devices. Now with voice, you've got to be cognizant of pitch, you know, range, and the type of utterances. So what we've been focused on moving forward is we're doing a lot of what we call multi-microphone pre-processing. So what we want to do is before we ask the assistant like Alexa to go and go through, through the NLU process, we want to make sure we provide as clean a signal as possible to work with to improve the accuracy. Um, so we've been out working with a lot of microphone manufacturers to go and help support this type of activity. Then speech, um, you know, what happens once Alexa actually gets the clean audio signal? So we have some integrated IP and hardware that we've been working on that uh, will accelerate a lot of this with improved performance, lower power, and uh, improved latency. So what that means is if you have an assistant like Alexa who's kind of in a standby sleep mode waiting for the wake word, we're trying to work to make sure that is done at the lowest possible power state and that when it does wake up, it wakes up as fast as possible. This same capability is also gonna help us with some future advancements where we wanna do speaker identification so that when you talk to your assistant, it knows who's talking to it. So that if I say, add you know, something to my calendar, it adds it to my calendar and not my wife's calendar. Design, many, many challenges there as well. As you can imagine, if you're putting Alexa on a watch versus a toaster versus a washing machine versus in a speaker, huge complexities and differences there. One a big learning for us was even when we made that um, smart speaker reference design, when you make a slight change to the dimensions of that design, we had to completely go through the tuning process again, just because just that slight change altered the experience enough, we needed to go and redo all of that validation. And then lastly, from a context perspective, you know, natural language understanding, we're making dramatic improvements in the cloud in that space as well as locally so that we can move from kind of a command and respond type of use case to one that's a bit more predictive. We've got a lot of advancements coming in our next generation CPUs, GPUs, and wireless technology that's going to kind of make that uh, human to machine interface much richer and much more immersive. So, you know, hopefully at this point you realize it's, you know, there's a lot of challenges when, when building your product and designing your product. Even once you've done that, though, the work's not done yet. You still have to deal with coordination of the software and the hardware. You need to go through certification, tuning, et cetera. These are all big challenges. So I just want to share, uh, you know, a couple other resources that we have available as well. We have support around the globe in China, Poland, Taiwan, and North America, where we have teams of people working specifically on voice-related technologies on all different form factors. So 180-degree microphone, 360-degree microphone, you know, when you got to talk down to something versus talk up to something, we're working on all different things like that. We have a vast ecosystem of third-party partners that we're working with to get, you know, the best key phrase detection or key phrase detection algorithms, the beam forming, the signal processing. So we're working with, you know, the best and brightest third parties out there. We also have a, a, a many labs that have what we call the speech platform evaluation tool. This is basically a tool that supports uh, multiple speech environments and allows you to test, the, you know, the overall end-to-end -end user experience for this device. So again, what I just wanted to share for all of those of you who are thinking about making your own products, we have some tools, we have some expertise, we want to help, we have a shared vision of getting Alexa everywhere, you know, so please reach out to myself, to Intel, to, to Amazon, to Matt, so that we can we'll help with these things. So hopefully at this point it's really clear, um, you know, we think at Intel that voice is absolutely foundational to having any type of smart home experience. You know, I say this sometimes and it's a little bit contentious, but we don't actually believe your homes are smart yet. We believe your homes have gotten extremely connected and that you have some smart devices in your home, but your house isn't smart yet. We think your house needs to become much more perceptive to what's going inside of it and what's going on outside of it. 
it needs to become much more responsive to that. And then ideally over time, it gets to the point where it's much more autonomous and helping out. So what I mean by that, you know, we need to get beyond these use cases where you have a security camera that, the, uh, you know, a, a branch blows in front of it every day and you get hundreds of alerts sent to your phone and to your watch all day. We need to get to the point where you've got some, some analysis going on that says, hey, this happens every day when it gets windy. I'm not going to go ahead and bother Miles that there's a, you know, a, a branch blowing in his back, backyard. So in order for your home to become more perceptive, responsive, and autonomous, we believe there needs to be significant improvements in the technologies and the capabilities in the home. I like to kind of tr trying to speak analogously to the human body here. I think it works fairly well. So we need to make sure the home can hear and it can speak so that you can interface with it. You know, check. We've been able to do that. You know, Amazon's proven that out with Alexa, and which is why we're so excited to help scale it. Next, you need to make sure your home can start seeing so that it can be more, again, receptive to what's going on in its environment. This one stretches the analogy a little bit, but we really need to prove the intravenous system. And what I mean by that is Gartner says that by 2022, the average home could have up to 500 connected devices. The key word there is connected. All of these things have to actually be connected and they need to talk to each other so that they can really deliver on the rich experiences. So we have to evolve the home network infrastructure to support that. And then lastly, the cognition. You know, again, we believe in a, a hybrid model of some amount of local cognition going, as well as then leveraging all of the machine learning and the deep learning in the cloud. You know, and, and the example I give is, let's say 2022, you know, the, the use, excuse me, 2020, the use case, you want to have security cameras outside of your house looking for anomalies. Let's say you've got four to six 4K cameras capturing at 10 frames per second, even on a motion event driven uh, basis, that's going to generate two terabytes of data a month just based on that. You know, there's no practical reason you would want to send two terabytes of data up to the cloud to analyze. What you'd want to do is you would want to locally pull out the, you know, probably 50 frames that are of any value, send those to the cloud, and then discard the rest. So that's what we're really trying to uh, drive, drive with at Intel. And so what we really believe is that, you know, when your house becomes perceptive, responsive, and autonomous, we can just start delivering real customer value, which is what our ethnographer research really pointed us to, which is, you know, give people peace of mind in their home, that their loved one and their assets are safe, help them and assist them in running their daily lives and improve the ease of running their home. These are things that they're really interested in. So again, we believe voice and Alexa is foundational to all of this. So we are very really ecstatic to continue to working with Amazon and look forward to working uh, more with all of you in the future. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Miles. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, leave here. Go buy a Raspberry Pi or an Intel Edison, actually, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and start the sample, and, and within a couple hours, you can have your own uh, device working and, and start building from there. So uh, we encourage you all to play with it. It's, it's intended for everyone to, to you know, experiment, hobby, and, and build. And so uh, definitely get going, and uh, we'd love to see what you build. So um, you missed all these talks, except for the last one. So if you want to stick around here, there's another talk on Alexa next um, right here. And uh, yeah, thank you again for coming in. Thank you for waking up early on a Friday after a late night uh, with a party. And uh, appreciate you guys coming out. And uh, please feel free to uh, fill out evaluations and let us know how we did. But thank you.